Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, based on where you are, and welcome to this deep dive into how Mass General Hospital's Center for the Neuroscience of Psychedelics is helping to better understand ways that psychedelic compounds facilitate lasting changes in mental health and well being, and as we'll learn today, in our sense of connection. For those who are new to the series, I suggest you also listen to the first three salons recordings for overviews and additional detailed information, and we'll be sending out links about that. So today, we'll get a behind the scenes look at one of the key pillars of the center being brought to life at Mass General Hospital, which is Harvard Medical School's primary teaching hospital and the hub of the Boston biomedical infrastructure. I'm Dick Simon, chair of the advisory council for the Center for Neuroscience of Psychedelics. And I'm spending all of my time to do what I can to advance therapies for treating a wide range of mental health issues. I'm motivated both by the data, which is incredibly compelling about the efficacy of these treatments and on a more personal level from having experienced the incredible difficulties and seeming intractable nature of mental health conditions in my own family. So I'm, I'm excited about this center with its unparalleled human and technological resources, as well as its integrative approach of psychiatry, chemical neurobiology, and neuroimaging. So as a reminder, at any time, you can type questions into the Q&A button and we'll address them during the question and answer session. Now, I'm happy to introduce my good friend, Dr. Gerald Rosenbaum, founding director of the MGH Center for the Neuroscience of Psychedelics. Jerry is psychiatrist and chief emeritus for MGH's psychiatry department, which he stewarded as the top ranked psychiatry department in the US for 20 years. He's also a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and brings 47 years as one of the preeminent psychiatrists and psychopharmacologist experts in the world to his passion here. Jerry, I turn over to you. Well, thank you, Dick, and welcome everybody. Uh, for those who have joined us before, welcome back. And to people who are uh, listening to a webinar for the first time, uh, we're glad to have you. As Dick mentioned, uh, there are three prior webinars and the link is uh, sent to you and uh, the invitation and will be sent out again uh, afterwards so that you can uh, see prior uh, webinars as well. Dick used the word pillars, and in fact, the Center for Neuroscience and Psychedelics is really built around four pillars, uh, fourth of which, the third of which you, you'll be uh, hearing about today. The first webinar was more of an introduction to the, the, the four components of our center, the uh, uh, Martino Center and its remarkable resources for uh, advanced uh, neuroimaging and uh, the, uh, uh, neuro, the uh, neurobiology uh, pillar headed by Steve Haggerty, uh, the clinical uh, uh, neuroscience and uh, cognitive neuroscience uh, component that uh, Sharman Ghaznavi is uh, leading and the training and education pillar that Franklin King is leading. And each uh, 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 summer. The first was an overview. The second featured uh, components of the of our neuroimaging, uh, our unique neuroimaging approaches and tools that have been created at the Martino Center. And the third webinar focused on ethnobotany and what we've called the Schulte's Legacy Project, focusing on uh, promising uh, uh, resources for uh, uh, developing novel uh, psychedelics with uh, um, the archive of plants at the uh, um, Schulte's uh, um, collection at the uh, Conway Library at Harvard. Um, today's uh, uh, webinar is going to focus on, I think, uh, what makes us uniquely human, uh, uh, and it, it will be focusing on the neuroscience of self, other, and human connection, and what that means for human suffering and relief of human suffering. Uh, we'll discuss how neuroscientists think about this issue and the role psychedelics uh, may play, not only in addressing uh, challenges related to uh, our uh, conception and uh, of self and relationship between self and others, 
uh, not only an understanding but alleviating suffering in those domains. The um, the, the webinar is going to be presented by uh, Dr. Sharman Ghaznavi, who directs uh, the clinical and cognitive neuroscience component of, of the center. Um, Dr. Ghaznavi uh, did her undergraduate work at MIT, uh, went to Yale to do her MD and PhD in uh, neuroscience, and came to Mass General for her residency in psychiatry and has stayed since on faculty. Uh, so we're looking forward to uh, Charmin, and I'll ask her to uh, begin her presentation shortly. But I want to remind people that uh, you can ask questions uh, through the Q and A uh, at any time. And and when um, Charmin is done with her presentation, we'll be spending the bulk of our time together uh, in discussions and, and answering questions. We are quite convinced that psychedelics offer a unique and important uh, window. Uh, uh, on uh, the brain and how the brain may change. And while we are convinced by the testimonials and data available that they, the available psychedelics are effective tools for treating human suffering and psychiatric disorder, our commitment, our focus in the center is really understanding that deeply and how, how psychedelics change the brain in hopes that we can use that information to really advance the field of therapeutics for human suffering and psychiatric disorders and develop novel uh, approaches and novel therapies. So with that, let me introduce Dr. Uh, Sharman uh, Ghaznavi, who will uh, be talking about um, uh, the neuroscience of the self, other, and human connection, and again, what that means uh, for our efforts in this center. So uh, welcome, Dr. Sharman Ghaznavi. Thank you for that introduction, Jerry. Let me just get her right here. And thank you all for joining us. These images convey a simple fact about human beings. We're social creatures. Our success and indeed our survival relies on our ability to form and sustain relationships with others. Unfortunately, for many of our patients with mental illness, impaired social functioning is a core feature of their illness. They struggle to form and maintain relationships, and their experience is often marked by loneliness. This deserves our attention because social support not only impacts the likelihood of developing a psychiatric illness, it impacts the course of the illness as well. Healthy, meaningful relationships are not only protective, they can be healing. Now, traditionally, relationships and social functioning have been considered the primary domain of psychotherapy. Psychedelic compounds present the revolutionary possibility that there might be a key role for psychopharmacology as well. Psychedelic compounds hold the promise of helping to improve social functioning. One, by increasing our brain's capacity for change, otherwise known as neuroplasticity. This would make our psychotherapeutic interventions more effective. Two, by increasing the sense of connection. Individuals who've used psychedelics, either on their own or as part of a study, report that afterwards they have an increased sense of connection with themselves, others, and the world. And three, by promoting pro-social attitudes and behaviors, such as helping and working towards a common goal. Now, while we know that psychedelics can increase the sense of connection and promote helpful attitudes and behaviors, we know very little about how the brain processes, about how the brain processes information in order to bring about that sense of connection and promote helpful attitudes and behaviors. What if we could change that? What if we could understand how psychedelic compounds impact the brain to bring about that sense of connection and promote those helpful attitudes and behaviors. What if we could use that knowledge in the service of our patients to help them connect with others and in turn alleviate their loneliness? Now, before I go into how we as a center hope to embark on this prospect, we need to cover some essential background. Central to an understanding of the science of human connection 
is an understanding of the two key players in a social interaction, namely self and other. Now I'm going to go into a few of the basic ways in which we understand self and other or distinguish between self and other. One of those ways is space. So imagining that I'm the woman seated here in this pictured in this scenario, I have the sense that I occupy a certain portion of space in the world on this side of the table. And it's different from the space occupied by the other person, which happens to be on the other side of the table. Space, especially between people, plays a key role in social interaction. We increase proximity in order to facilitate social interaction and distance in order to decrease social interaction. Another way in which we understand self and other related to this is the sense of being embodied. So I have the sense that the body wearing a dark green shirt with dark brown hair up in a bun is the body that I inhabit. And it's distinct from the other person's body whom I'm looking at and speaking to. A third way in which we understand self and other is in terms of beliefs. So I have the belief that I'm a woman and that I'm speaking in order to communicate something. I have beliefs about the other person as well. I believe that he's a man and that he's seemingly interested in what I'm saying, judging by his posture and eye contact. A fourth way in which we distinguish between self and other is in terms of agency. So I have this distinct sense that I'm the one speaking and the other person is choosing to listen. Successful interactions and connections necessitate an understanding of ourselves and others. You might imagine that this interaction wouldn't go so well if I got uncomfortably close because I failed to appreciate the space that I occupy and the space that's occupied by the other person. Unfortunately for our patients with mental illness, there are breakdowns in this process that result in failures to form and maintain connections. Now what I'd like to do is go through two ways in which this breakdown happens. I would hazard a guess that most everyone listening has at some point engaged in self-reflection. After all, we reflect on our past actions and experiences in order to learn, improve, and grow. But for many of our patients, the self-reflection can go awry and they ruminate. Rumination is the tendency to repetitively focus on oneself and one's symptoms of distress without engaging in active problem solving. It's often a vicious vortex of self-disparagement and self-blame. If only I'd made a different choice, why me? What could I have done differently? Much of our research on rumination is in depression. However, we're increasingly appreciating that rumination affects the course of illness in nearly every psychiatric disorder. This isn't that surprising if one thinks about how central our concept of self is to our experience. Now, how does rumination interfere with social functioning? Well, for one, rumination involves a lot of negative thoughts about oneself, such as I'm a failure and no one likes me. This leads to decreased self-esteem and a decreased sense of self-efficacy, which decreases the likelihood of engaging with others. Why bother if no one likes me? And it turns out that for our patients who are even able to get past that and engage with others, their rumination can still lead them to frustrate others because of the self-preoccupation and negative outlook. This strains their interactions and in turn their relationships. Earlier in this talk, I mentioned the term loneliness and described how for many of our patients, their experience could be described as lonely. What I hope to convey now is that loneliness is a perception of the other gone awry. In research circles, loneliness is defined as the distress that accompanies the perception that one's social needs are not being met by the quantity or especially the quality of one's social relationships. So loneliness is the subjective sense that one's social connections are lacking. It's irrespective of how large one's social network actually is, or whether others would judge that one has meaningful relationships. Loneliness 
impacts the likelihood of developing a psychiatric illness and also adversely impacts the course of psychiatric illness. What's more, loneliness is not just a determinant of mental health, it's a determinant of physical health as well. With morbidity and mortality on par with drinking excessively, daily smoking, and obesity. Now, how has loneliness perception of the other gone awry? It turns out that loneliness is associated with deficits in reasoning about how others think and feel, otherwise known as theory of mind. To illustrate this, I've included this comic from Mimi and Eunice. In the first panel, Mimi is standing there silently, and Eunice assumes the worst of Mimi. I know what you're thinking, terrible things about me. In the second panel, Eunice becomes further enraged. Well, screw you and your judgments, and she walks off. In the third panel, we find out that all Mimi was doing was thinking about the pie she's gonna have next week. So Eunice incorrectly reasons about what Mimi is thinking, reacts poorly, and walks away, thus missing out on an opportunity to connect and maybe even have a piece of pie. Now, how does all of this relate to the brain and psychedelics? Recent advances in neuroimaging, coupled with an increasing interest in how the brain functions in social contexts, has led to an, a rapidly expanding body of knowledge about how our brains process information about ourselves and others. When it comes to processing information about ourselves, whether that's our body and space or beliefs we hold, we tend to activate brain regions along the midline of the brain. When it comes to making specific judgments about personality traits or physical characteristics, the brain region most activated is the medial prefrontal cortex. More recently, our techniques, and in turn our science, has become a little bit more sophisticated. And we've come to appreciate that it's not just a matter of certain brain regions being active, but that networks of brain regions work in concert to process different kinds of information. One of those networks is a network that's active at rest, called the default mode network. It turns out that this same network is also important for processing information about the self. The thought is that when we're left to our own devices, to muse, if you will, we tend to turn inwards and reflect on ourselves, whether that's how we're feeling or what we did earlier this morning. Not surprisingly, given that rumination is an intense form of self-focus, rumination also involves the default mode network, and specifically a subsystem consisting of the medial prefrontal cortex and cingulate corti cortices specifically the posterior cingulate cortex. So we have a network of brain regions that are involved in processing self that happens to be particularly active when people ruminate. Now enter a study by Robin Carhart Harris and colleagues. They looked at brain activity in healthy volunteers following placebo and an intravenous infusion of psilocybin. What they found was that following psilocybin, there was decreased resting state activity in the default mode network. What's more, this activity correlated with the subjective effects of psilocybin, especially activity in the medial prefrontal cortex. An interesting related fact is that individuals who use psilocybin report that their experience is one where they have a loss of their sense of self, sometimes referred to as ego dissolution. One wonders whether decreased activity in this network of brain regions involved in processing the self corresponds to that loss of sense of self and ego dissolution. In any case, we wondered if we could impact rumination, which is after all an intense form of self-focus using psilocybin. And this is precisely the question we hope to answer with one of our first studies at the center. Our hope is that using psilocybin, we can help our patients with major depression ruminate less or not ruminate at all, and thus improve their functioning, including their social functioning. Our hope is that if patients ruminate less, 
if they can get out of their own way, so to speak, and out of their vortex of suffering, then perhaps they'll be able to connect with others better. Interestingly, in another study, also by Robin's group, this time in patients with major depression who were treated with psilocybin, they found that at follow-up, those patients who endorsed psilocybin's effectiveness also reported an increased sense of connection with themselves, others, and the world. Now, what about the brain processes involved in understanding others? Fortunately, we've come a long way towards understanding the brain regions and networks of brain regions that are involved in understanding how we process information about other people as well, ranging from how we reason about what they might be thinking and feeling to how we empathize with their suffering and show compassion towards others. What I'd like to do now is specifically bring your attention to those brain regions that are involved in reasoning about how others think and feel. Note that the medial prefrontal cortex and posterior cingulate cortex are involved here as well. These are the same brain regions that were involved in how we process information about ourselves. It turns out that sometimes when we're trying to reason about how someone else might be thinking or feeling, we imagine how we might think or feel in that situation. This is especially true for those whom we're closest to. Interestingly, just this year, there was a study looking at the relationship between loneliness and activity in the medial prefrontal cortex when making judgments about ourselves and others. What Courtney and Meyer found was that the more lonely one feels, the less likely there is to be overlap in activity in the medial prefrontal cortex when making judgments about oneself and others. A neural marker, if you will, of the lack of connectedness between self and others. They also found that the more lonely one feels, the less likely the activity is to distinguish between Close, close others, such as a partner, and distant others, such as a celebrity. If you think about it, it's pretty important to be able to distinguish one's partner from a celebrity. Now enter another study by Robin Carhart Harris and colleagues. This time they looked at brain activity and healthy volunteers again, after placebo and after MDMA. What they found was that after MDMA, there was decreased resting state functional connectivity between the medial prefrontal cortex and posterior cingulate cortex. This is the very network of brain regions involved in how we reason about how others might be thinking or feeling. Interesting. As many of you may know, MDMA has achieved breakthrough status for the treatment of PTSD. One of the things we know about our patients with PTSD is that they struggle significantly with social functioning. Oftentimes, mistrust and or aggression interferes with their ability to connect with others and form the very relationships that would help them. Research shows that patients with PTSD show deficits in their ability to reason about how other people might be thinking or feeling, that is deficits in theory of mind. They also show differences in activity in the brain regions that are critical to reasoning about how others are thinking and feeling. So we got to wondering, is it possible that MDMA-assisted psychotherapy helps our patients with PTSD, in part by helping them better reason about how others are thinking and feeling and essentially connecting with them? And this is the basis for another line of investigation at the center whether and how MDMA impacts our ability to reason about others' thoughts and feelings. And so what I hope I've shown you today is that the confluence of decades of research in neuroscience, social cognition, and now psychedelics presents us with a unique opportunity to potentially help our patients better connect with others and thus alleviate a root cause of their suffering, namely disconnection and loneliness. 
And this couldn't be more timely. In the United States, we're reeling from an election that has left rifts across our nation and among friends and family. All of us are facing a holiday season, unlike any other, forced to be apart from our family and friends for their safety and ours. And we're entering month nine or more, depending on how you count it, of a global pandemic that has necessitated physical and social distancing, only furthering a epidemic of loneliness. Most of us will emerge from these challenges, a little bruised, but fine, resilient, buoyed by the relationships in our lives. But others of us will emerge worse for the wear. Experts warn that when this pandemic ends and in the coming years, we'll be faced with the mental health pandemic born out of this. We need to be ready to meet that challenge in all of its facets. Thank you. Charmin, thank you for that tour de force uh, overview of this incredibly important topic that's so essential to being human. You know, uh, uh, you were mentioning the psilocybin work and ego dissolution and rumination and sense of self, and in the context of a um, uh, sense of others and loneliness, you referred to the work where uh, now partially supported by MAPS, and we continue to seek additional support for this study of MDMA and uh, compassion-focused uh, mindfulness and PTSD. Um, it's almost as if uh, you're starting to um, um, describe a what we one of our goals in this center, which is a kind of uh, precision psychedelics to so identify different molecules for different. Um, individuals in different challenges. Were, were, you, were, were you meaning to imply that psilocybin is more relevant to um, the perception of self as uh, the work described in the default mode network and rumination and MDMA more about more pro-social and others? Or is that still an open question uh, whether they uh, differentiate along those, uh, uh, those different uh, parameters? Well, I think um, we, there's a lot more that we need to know. I mean, we, the reality is that we know how these substances impact the brain at rest, but we have yet to know how they impact different kinds of functioning. So for instance, how we reason about self or other. I think we're really at the beginnings of understanding that information. And it may turn out that one psychedelic is better suited to addressing one symptom or one area of functioning, whereas another psychedelic is better for another area of functioning. And it might even be one psychedelic coupled with a particular behavioral or psychosocial intervention. It's, yeah, that's a great point because uh, the other variable is the, the uh, therapy as we uh, always uh, intend to focus on the fact that these are uh, psychedelic uh, assisted therapies and the type of therapy may have as much to do with the therapeutic goal as the, uh, um, as the particular psychedelic. One question uh, uh, here that says that family history is a known significant in fact, development of psychiatric illness. Is there a way in which um, our understanding of how psychedelics influence these uh, underlying risk factors like perception of self or others or um, that uh, they might one day be in a role of uh, early intervention or prevention? Well, you know, especially when we consider the fact that psychedelics are associated with an increased capacity for change in the brain or increased neuroplasticity, there may be a unique opportunity to not only treat mental illness, but prevent mental illness. So one way in which you might imagine this is, you know, shoring up resilience in a population that is particularly at risk. Um, for instance, um, family members who have a history of, who have a, who have a family member who has been depressed, they're actually at a threefold increased likelihood of developing depression. Now imagine if we could intervene early enough before they have their first depressive episode to 
actually help them develop their resilience. Because as, as you were just talking about, it's not just about psychedelics working their magic, but also creating an opportunity for us to intervene with psychotherapy to change patterns and possibly shore up coping. Mm -hmm. Great. And Dick, I know you're curating some of the questions that are coming in from listeners. Do you want yeah. to? Yeah, and we have a number of great questions here. Um, one is a question, does the experience of using MDMA and, and other psychedelics and learning from that experience stay with you so that you don't need to continue to use psychedelic drugs or is this, this, this become a, a chronic medicine? Well, one of the remarkable things about psychedelic compounds is how long their benefits last. Um, it's still an open question, but so far they last months to even a year out. Um, and so some things may not require an additional dose, while others might. And again, it might be a matter of what psychotherapy is coupled with it and what psychotherapy one continues and learns from. Thanks. Um, another question. Uh, does, does meditation also induce a sense of oneness, pro-social attitude, and increased neuroplasticity? And can it replace the need for psychedelics or any, anything about that interaction or potential? Well, it's interesting that you asked this, Dick, because um, before we um, considered looking at psychedelics, you know, we were actually looking at exploring mindfulness to treat rumination, because it turns out that mindfulness also decreases activity in the default mode network. Um, and so originally we thought maybe we could couple mindfulness um, with one of our current standard treatments to help decrease rumination in our patients and help them function better. And then we came to learn that psychedelics such as psilocybin are even more powerful at decreasing the default mode network activity, um, thus providing a more powerful alternative to addressing rumination. One of the interesting testimonials you do hear from people who have uh, used psilocybin and were meditators is that after their uh, uh, experience with psilocybin, they felt they became much better at meditation, more uh, med meditation was uh, um, more effective. Uh, have you heard that as well, Dick? Yeah, um, I've heard that and I've also seen uh, imaging showing the brains of long-term meditators looking exactly like those people who are you know, on a psych utilizing psychedelics and beings. Uh, yeah, and yeah, you do see uh, increased cortical thickening and in uh, meditators, both those long-term, and, and then in a, a study done by Sarah Lazar here at Mass General, um, people who had, had not meditated were uh, uh, randomized to continue to not meditate or start meditating, and you started to see the same changes, cortical thickening and areas that are associated uh, with increased resilience, or at least in, in rodents with uh, 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 more enhanced extinction learning. So it does seem like uh, you're seeing brain changes from this uh, practice, and presumably those who are, will, will resonate uh, uh, or amplify or synergize with the uh, use of psychedelics. Yeah, um, definitely. So uh, another question is, like with a COVID vaccine, psychedelic treatment is subject to both public suspicion and even if it's accepted as useful, you know, availability. Can you comment it on sort of th this whole issue regarding public suspicion and, and, and how that might play out? Well, you know, one of our hopes as a center is that um, we'll be able to use knowledge to sort of fight the stigma and misperception surrounding psychedelic compounds. Um, you know, we are, we have a long history of, tr you know, addressing stigma and mental illness. And our greatest tool has been all the knowledge we've gained about its etiology and treatment. And it's been powerful in convincing people to destigmatize mental illness. And we can hope that the same will be true for psychedelics. And Sharman, you referred uh, uh, you know, to personal space and, and I know, uh, you know your colleague Daphne Holt has done uh, specific work on uh, uh, personal space in, in uh, 
chronic and severe psychiatric disorder and that you and she have been talking about some potential studies in that area. Could you say more about her work and how it amplifies what, what you were describing? Yeah, so Daphne does really um, important work looking at how um, personal space is, um, you know, aberrant in certain psychiatric conditions, most notably psychotic conditions in which people um, with psychotic disorders need greater personal distance in order, or, or greater range of personal space in order to feel comfortable. And we got to talking because one of the things that COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic has necessitated is physical distancing. So right now our sense of personal space, especially when we're outside our homes or outside our bubbles, um, is bigger than it would have been nine months ago. And the question becomes, when the pandemic ends, how do we go back to feeling normal about a more usual sense of personal space? Because as we mentioned, you know, personal, you know, space, personal space and the space in between individuals does impact social connection and interaction. And so we're going to have to go back to a more normal sense of personal space in order to have foster healthy interaction. You probably remember uh, some years ago uh, when uh, people were were excited about the promise of a new generation of antidepressants in around 1990, early 1990s. And uh, Peter Kramer wrote uh, the, the listening to Prozac and there was all, all this uh, uh, conversation about cosmetic pharmacology because the medication sometimes seemed to help patients that um, didn't necessarily meet full criteria for psychiatric disorders. So the same question really, you know, while we're, you know, as a, uh, uh, physicians and psychiatrists and neuroscientists focus more on psychiatric disorders, but um, the uh, potential application of these compounds is really broader than that. Um, so, um, do you how how do you think about the use of psychedelics for people who, let's say, don't have a psychiatric di disorder but want to enhance social function or um, a relationship to themselves or uh, you know, are we now talking about, you know, uh, uh, this kind of distress on a spectrum, or do we still think there are these discrete categories of psychiatric disorders, diagnoses, we call them, that have, um, you know, for which these medicines have unique promise, and that's somehow different than just helping others with their, their own uh, uh, life issues? It's a, if you follow that, it's a little rambling question. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, we, we definitely don't want to um, suggest that uh, there's one magic bullet for everybody or that um, things will work um, under normal circumstances that might work with patients. But we have to be open to the possibility that we might find that some combination can actually be helpful in other contexts where there isn't severe psychopathology. So, you know, already, um, especially in underground circles, people are using MDMA for couples therapy, in part because it can increase the sense of connection and pro-social um, feelings. So some of that's already happening. It'd be great if we could better understand it to utilize it in the best possible and safest possible way to serve similar purposes. Right. I mean, one, one question that comes in is uh, that there are, uh, as we understand it, there are some psychiatric disorders, patients with psychiatric disorders for whom we think that um, psychedelics are contraindicated. I, uh, so I, you know, does the work that we're doing in this area have promise for those people and how do you think about that? And in particular, I'd add several people are asking questions with regard to bipolar. Yeah, so that's great because um, I, my clinical specialty is bipolar disorder. And so I always think about how even with many of the studies we're starting, I can't enroll most of my patients um, who need something. But you know, the point is that we can take this knowledge and use it to either um, find new therapies, and this is where the work with, with Steve Haggerty really comes in. There is an entire collection, the Schultes collection, of plants that we have yet to explore and who might have similar properties without some of the negative properties that, that limit it for certain populations. The other thing is that 
we can impact networks in other ways besides psychopharmacology, including uh, TMS and uh, direct current stimulation. So if we know which networks are involved and um, what kinds of therapies to couple them with, we might be able to impact those networks using other modalities that don't have some of the uh, side effects that would be contraindicated in other patient populations. Um, and we can help those patients as well. Great. Um, so a question here, would you care to venture a guess about where oxytocin may fit into all of this? We know MDMA increases oxytocin levels and can enable social bonding. Is there any sense you know, venturing a guess? Well, we know that oxytocin promotes connection, right? I mean, whether that's in mothers with their babies or it turns out octopi. Um, so, you know, the question is how is the oxytocin released and what are the different kinds and how does that impact interact with different networks to produce the bonding? There's a question about uh, how ketamine, uh, which is now in use as a um, or approved by the FDA as a drug treatment, but not necessarily uh, uh, as a, a facilitating psychotherapy, but obviously there are practitioners out there doing that way. How does that fit into what we're talking about? Does, uh, does uh, ketamine uh, have the same uh, potential with regard to the, uh, what we've discussed today about uh, um, you know, distortions in self and, and others? So actually, we know even less about the cognitive neuroscience of ketamine. Um, so it's a, a relatively unexplored area. But based on what people report with using it, there's, there's good reason to, to sort of ask questions and find out more. Mm -hmm. yeah. Another question is about, uh, we know everybody has you know, genetic, different genetic risk profile and different brains. Um, are we going to be able to... Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, do we assume that all brains are equal or, or are we going to uh, work to uh, match with individual genetic inheritance, temperament, character, et cetera? Well, we definitely appreciate that all brains are not e created equal. And in fact, this is part of the mo motivation behind precision psychiatry. So and some of the work that Dr. Haggerty is doing, um, taking actual um, stem cells from individuals turning them into organoids or mini brains that we can study in a, in a dish and looking at who responds and who doesn't, who has what side effect um, where others don't, what's different about their genetic makeup and their brains that result in that difference. Right. There's a couple of questions about risk. Uh, uh, some have asked, are there, is there a health risk in taking moderate amounts of psychedelics, uh, presumably over time. And then there's another question, are, are these agents potentially addictive? The research is pretty clear that these agents are not addictive. Um, they just don't work in the same way. Um, but whether or not there are health risks long-term depends on the substrate. Um, you know, so what's, what's risky for one person, depending on their you know, cardiometabolic risk factors, is different than another person. So another question here, uh, studies of psilocybin have used synthetic compounds versus naturally occurring psilocybin mushrooms. What's the difference and why would one do that and does it matter? I think what the differences are is an open question. And that's part of what um, Steve Harry wants to look at, is is there a difference between some of the um, original botanical specimens and the pharmaceutical grade psilocybin that we're using? We don't know, it's an empirical question. Yeah. So there's some uh, interesting questions uh, uh, about the role of the therapy. And uh, I, mean, I don't know if it's chicken and egg or what's primary, uh, but how, uh, how much of the change uh, can you attribute to the therapy versus the, uh, um, the, the the psychedelic uh, administration, and how do you tease that out? One, another question was, is it possible that uh, from a psychoanalytic perspective that uh, you can conceptualize um, 
what's happening in the uh, psychedelic uh, uh, treatment state is uh, that the classic concept of repressions coming into consciousness is part of the healing process. Anyway, so just whatever your thoughts are about the how to think about, you know, uh, like in ketamine, we use it as a drug, not necessarily to assist therapy, although you might say it's a therapeutic experience in the kind of way it's administered. But uh, just general thoughts about the, the, the relative importance of the type of therapy, the role of therapy, and, and you know, uh, uh, the importance of the two together. Yeah, so in terms of like how important is the therapy versus the psychedelic compound, I mean, or what's doing more of the work, those are empirical questions and we have to actually um, carry out the experiments in which we modify them in order to know. We do know that psychedelics are doing something special um, because somehow suddenly people with very treatment-resistant illnesses are getting better after just one or two doses. Um, so there's something more uh, powerful about them. But that doesn't mean that they obviate the therapy. And in fact, they really make the therapy um, come into relief because what, 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 co what comes about is that um, the connection even between the therapist and the patient matters a great deal. So, you know, you were mentioning looking at this psychodynamically. What all of my psychodynamic supervisors told me is that the relationship that happens in the room between the patient and therapist is as important as any relationship they have with their family members or their parents. Because a lot, of, a lot happens in the room from learning to trust someone else, playing out certain scenarios and issues. And the therapist provides this constant to help heal issues that the, therapy, that the patient has experienced before. And one can imagine that somehow the psychedelics make that even more powerful connection. Those of you who have been on prior webinars know the story how Sharman and I uh, got uh, connected to the world of uh, psychedelics and, and the neuroscience of psychedelics because of an um, antecedent interest in the phenomenon of rumination, a uh, uh, topic we were working on, and Sharman created a uh, a scale to use in studies and has a lot of data f f uh, from that. And one of one when we when we think about the various ways we try to help patients who were ruminating before, uh, among the several um, recommendations, you know, were meditation and exercise and you know a non-inflammatory diet and CBT and other things. But one one uh, recommendation was to uh, was to use walks in nature, which seemed to have a uh, positive effect uh, on, uh, on, on ruminators. And one of the questions that uh, has uh, been asked is the, well, we talk about changing the uh, perception of self and relationship with self and others. What about um, with nature and the outside world? Is that uh, uh, consistent with that notion that as you are more connected with nature, you tend to feel, uh, you tend to ruminate less intensely? Well, you know, it's interesting because, um, you know, for, for example, in the study that I mentioned from Robin's group, people reported that they had not only an increased sense of connectedness with themselves and others, but also the world. And by that, they mean the natural world. I think one of the things that happens either with mindfulness or some sort of meditation or psychedelics, when you can get outside of yourself, you have a you begin to have a sense of where you fit in in something bigger, including the world. And that just opens up the possibility for having more of a sense of connection to something larger than yourself. And that includes the natural world. So a question here about if you believe that the same dynamics that create uh, therapeutic benefits for say PTSD or depressed patients uh, will have similar impact with OCD and anxiety disorders and sort of your, your sense is the potential of these substances and these therapies. Well, you know, irrespective of what diagnostic category our patients come from, they've had challenges across their life uh, and they've had challenges in their relationships, either because of their illness or 
giving rise to their illness. And in some respects, these compounds can help all of these patient populations just in terms of increasing the potential for change and for potentiating the therapies that we have available. Yeah. Um, uh, one one attendee asked about participating in studies. Do you want to say something about our, when we're likely to be able to re uh, enter subjects in the, in the first study on psilocybin and treatment-resistant depression and rumination? Yes, our first study is currently under review by the FDA, and so hopefully we're looking at six months. Um, of course, COVID can impact that, but hopefully we'll be able to enroll within, this, within about six months. Okay. Dick, do you have other? Um... Sure. Uh, for, first, I just wanted to uh, share a comment that uh, someone made in the questions that they have been, admin, admi it was on the question of related to the bipolar conversation earlier, that they've been administering IV ketamine for depression and PTSD for about eight years, and they've treated bipolar patients, and so long as they're not experiencing uh, symptom, manic symptoms, um, they're, they're often on mood stabilizers, and they've had very positive effects. So I was just sort of sharing uh, you know, a, a, a comment that we got there. There are several questions here regarding microdosing, which uh, is, is talked about a lot. Um, are there any, any thoughts or comments there that you might want to share? Well, I think we don't know very much about microdosing. I know that it's a practice that folks have, but we actually have very little research. I don't know that we have any significant research on what happens with microdosing and what are, you know, definitely not any neuroscience related to it. Yeah, you certain, certainly do have a lot of testimonials of people saying it's been helpful to them, but uh, I don't think we have, uh, you know, uh, the kind of data that we have for, uh, uh, you know, the neuroimaging data uh, or uh, treatment studies. Uh, did, are you aware of studies of microdosing data? That... Uh, small work, in a, I'm aware of a couple that didn't have, you know, very conclusive results yet. Yeah. So, you know, a, a lot of people are talking about doing and investigating, but uh, my experience is that there's not yet any uh, significant hard data you can imagine that in the uh, Haggerty lab, where, when we're use, using the uh, organoids, uh, we can certainly look at the difference between uh, uh, very low dose and then more, uh, and more uh, typical dose on, uh, on neuroplasticity and neuronal sprouting and, and so forth, and get a sense of whether uh, at least uh, you know you're seeing any signal of biological change in those models. That might be a, a convenient thing to. To use to uh, to to study, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it would be challenging at this point without um, some kind of data to to uh, muster larger studies of uh, that approach. But uh, certainly worth doing. Yeah. Um, so we're getting near the uh, the end. Uh, I guess we can take one more question, uh, Dick. If you if you sure. have. Uh, could you share your thoughts on the importance and implication of the phenomena known as ego dissolution on the perception of self and others? And that included a thank you for the presentation, which comes from all of us, but was written by that person. So it, it, it's pretty interesting, right, that um, individuals who view psilocybin describe this um, loss of sense of self, and Robin and his colleagues find that there's decreased activity in the in um, that exact same network of regions that's involved in processing information about the self. Um, one wonders whether this corresponds. The study studies weren't designed to look at exactly that, but that's something that we're hoping to take a look at because we're gonna look at how people process information about the self specifically to begin to look at this. I mean, people say that if you have that experience, you're more likely to have benefit, but then we do also, Lots of individuals who have maybe even unpleasant experiences or, or don't have ego dissolution will still uh, report uh, benefit from uh, the treatment. So yeah, I think it's, uh, it, it's there to, for further study. 
Um, so with that, uh, Sharman, thank you for uh, uh, absolutely uh, clear and thoughtful and uh, important presentation in an area that's very complicated. Dick, uh, thank you again for you know, being our uh, leader of our council and our patron for all you've done for, for the center. And, and to all of you who have joined us today, thank you so much for being part of this. We'll be back in touch uh, going forward about our next webinar which will likely uh, uh, focus on our educational and training and, uh, and uh, uh, dissemination efforts uh, for the center in the, as we uh, proceed on our mission to uh, understand the neuroscience of psychedelics. So again, thank you so much for being with us and look forward to seeing you all again. Take care.